Thank you, Linda. And thank you all for joining this session. Um, I'm going to see if you're comfortable, if you can just add into the chat your name and if you're connected to an organization or if you have a connection to reach up that you're interested in sharing um, or what your role is or what brings you to the session. Um, I'll get started. We won't pause too much to look through it, but it'll be really helpful for me to see as we go. Um, so my name is Amy Rose. I'm a policy associate with Voices for Vermont's Children. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, we have a lot to share. There's a lot in progress, even while we speak over at the legislature um, involving the new reach up bill. That's a consolidation of two bills. And even as I was thinking about this last night, I was cautiously optimistic that there might be some significant changes that um, would really impact children and families. And today I'm like throwing caution to the wind and I'm actually very optimistic that we have great language coming um, out of House Human Services and a collection of um, interest and uh, real collaboration between advocates, participants who have shared their, their real life stories, um, the state who is bringing in amazing language to the bill um, and the legislators who are asking incredible questions. It was really hard to hop away to, to join the session, honestly. So um, I think we have a great, great starting place for today. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I'm going to share my screen. And in doing that, I probably won't be able to see if you're raising your hand. Um, so um, feel free to just kind of jump in if, if needed. So I'm going to start with just a brief overview. Um, of the purpose of Reach Up. So Reach Up is Vermont's TANF program, um, and it has a number of objectives. I like to highlight the three that um, really make sense to me as a child and family advocate. Um, one is to support parental nurturing. Another is to measure the success of the system by what is best for children. And another is to improve the well being of children by providing for their immediate basic needs, including food, housing, and clothing. And um, many of you may know that the state has been doing quite a bit of work to kind of reimagine or restructure the child protection system. And part of that is coming through the Families First legislation. And some of the things that I've been hearing this morning in testimony is, is very similar to that around making sure that all family supports, um, that all children and families are receiving the same um, access to funding and to dignity and to sort of meeting folks where they are to make sure that they can get to a place of um, well-being. So let me see if I can. Uh... The other piece that really kind of stands out to me is just to identify that in Vermont and kind of nationally, we include food, housing, and clothing in the, in the basic needs category. Um, we'll get that to, to that later because I think housing is one piece that there could be some continued advocacy for, um, but Reach Up really talks about meeting all of families' basic needs, which includes kind of making sure that all of those pieces are met. So currently in the legislature, there's one bill progressing in House Human Services, which is H-464. And that is a combination of two bills that were introduced in the beginning of the year. Um, and collectively, though that bill um, aims to do a few things. One is it would increase benefits and allow for more pass-throughs. It would update case management language to create more opportunities for collaboration. Um, there's been quite a bit of testimony about that from the department and um, it seems to be a focus of the, of the testimony this morning as well. It would shift work requirements. It would remove DCF's second review of medical status. It would allow both parents to seek post-secondary education if desired in two parent households. And, um, there are a couple of things that are missing from the bill. Um, one would be the, the part that would maintain housing for children and pregnant parents and um, an elimination of the rateable reduction. So I wanna start with the positive. I'm really excited about the language around the work requirements in particular. Um, the commissioner proposed new language today and I printed it out because it demonstrates a massive shift in sort of the way we we look at families um, and talk about stabilizing people's lives rather than putting requirements on them or um, punishing them for um, responding to barriers to employment. And so um, in the past, there's been work requirements that have been um, enforced for um, 
single parent and for one parent and for two parent households. And there's kind of a breakdown of, of what is required. This new legislation would shift that to encourage everybody to participate in the program. And it defines participation very broadly. So there isn't an hour requirement, but instead it would list a number of participation activity um, opportunities. And I wanna name them because I think the, the way that they're developed is really um, humane and helpful in terms of kind of moving families to where they need to go. So the new law, if it continues to progress and if the language is adopted, would include um, for participation, employment, workforce development, career specific training programs, English as a second language, literacy and math skills, credentials, entrepreneurship and business development courses, job search and career exploration, work experience, job shadow opportunities, education, high school diploma work, technical training and vocational education, college, career specific education, and, and most notably, it would also include building foundations for employment. And in this, they include housing searching, housing searches, arranging transportation, arranging childcare, family and financial well-being, including financial capability classes and coaching, mental health treatment, treatment for substance use disorder, working with children's health and school professionals and applying for supplemental security income and working with family services. And so this really gets at the need to ensure folks are engaged in the program in order to meet their goals, but takes away the historical racist work requirements and the pieces that have really been designed to punish single family um, households. I do have, I brought with me a bunch of testimony that I'd received from families who have participated in, in Reach Up that highlight the way in which um, the requirements have not worked for them. They've gotten in the way of them meeting their career goals. Um, and I was planning on sharing them with you today, but the fact that this language is so amazing already, I think I'm going to pause on that. And if we have time at the end and if folks are, are interested in hearing it, I can do that. But one of the things that was shared quite a bit this morning is that we often ask families to come forward and share their trauma in order to make change. And that it can be really difficult to continue to put folk stories out there. And so if, if it's not required to make the change, I'm gonna kind of hold on to it um, and just share the themes if folks are interested. And so, oops. I want to spend a little bit time talking about the rateable reduction. Um, it's one of the pieces that we're hoping to work on both this year and in the years ahead. I just want to sort of get a sense of the room. I'm looking at the list of participants and I imagine most of you are aware of the rateable reduction but if anybody is is interested in a little bit more of the background if you can just put that in the chat I don't want to share stuff that you're already quite familiar with I'm going to pause for a second so currently, um, when we figure out what the grant is for a family in Vermont, um, there's a multi-stage process for doing that. And so the budget, as we know, is a collaborative effort <laughs> between the administration and the legislature. And once we have the full um, appropriation for the program, um, the state tries to stay within that amount by figuring out what the participation rate might be and, and figuring out what they can offer for a base grant. And so currently in Vermont, we're offering 90, I mean, 49.6% of what would be needed to get a family to basic needs. And as a reminder, the basic needs is really not an abundance budget. <laughs> it's a scarcity budget. It's meeting basic housing food requirements um, based on the federal poverty level for cost of living. And so we're giving families less than half of what they need to, to meet all the basic needs of their children and families. This has often been discussed as a way that sets families up for failure, but we have had a difficult time moving the rateable reduction because it becomes a budgetary issue. Folks are, are struggle to appropriate enough funding to meet the basic needs of children and families. And so 
one of the things that um, we're hopeful for in this bill would be to, to make sure that the cost of living is indexed every year at the current amount so that we know exactly what a family would need to meet their basic needs. And then to gradually reduce that rate of reduction or ideally eliminate it <laughs> so that families could get to the basic poverty level. And unfortunately, you know, the REACH UP program is a safety net program and um, it's really meant to fill in that gap. Um, but ideally what we would wanna do is get families to a better place where they could save and have assets and really be more stable for the long term. And so um, one of the things that can happen is through the rulemaking process or through legislative action is we could reduce the rateable reduction over year. Um, and that will be something that we'll continue to advocate for in this bill. Um, but it's also something that if we, um, that if we're able to kind of shift in policy in years to come, if we have a better sense of what families are actually getting, we'll have a, an easier time describing sort of what's left out. And I see I've got a question. How do we know anecdotally or statistically about how families meet remaining 51% of need? That's a great question, Stacey. Um, we've talked to a lot of families and many of them don't, um, honestly. Oftentimes the conversations that they have are um, about sort of what needs go unmet when they don't have all their basic needs met. So many families are living sort of in the red, not being able to make all of their rent payments, um, not being able to make their utilities. They have to make a choice. We have a video that we can show that kind of talks about step-by-step step how folks budget and try to make it work. Um, and oftentimes it doesn't work. Um, we do know that some folks um, have to be creative. And I think sometimes, honestly, that's what drives people into the criminal justice system for crimes of survival when families see their kids needs not being met and have to do things that are outside of the structure of our law in order to get to survival. Um, I actually did a focus group at the correctional facility in Chittenden County and talked to families who um, talked to women who are incarcerated um, based on crimes that mostly we're trying to meet the needs of their kids. Um, I don't think that's the common answer. I think, you know, people are creative and they try to scrounge together what they can, whether it be from community donations or um, trying to make the best of what they have. But the sad truth is that when, you know, when we don't get to basic needs, kids go without. They go without soap, they go without food. They try to use as many um, of the supplemental services that they can, um, but, but it's tricky um, and we leave them in really difficult situations and kids suffer. So this program is really about kids and families. And so when we talk about not getting to basic needs, we're talking about not meeting the needs of, of Vermont's children. And I'm gonna pause because I know we do have a lot of expertise in the room. And so um, many of you probably have worked with folks who have experienced Reach Up. And if anyone wants to jump in and talk about a little bit about what they've seen and how the rateable reduction affects um, kids and families. I wanna give you a chance to do that as well. Amy, maybe I'll just, uh, can I chime in and answer my own question? <laughs> yes. I mean, I guess what I've seen at King Street and what concerns me is, uh, families are braiding together so many pieces or we're asking them to braid together so many pieces, they cannot keep track of the names, the dates, the forms, the number of times each different organization wants them to write down the same information. And I feel like the overall impact that I see is like a, a bit of a checkout. Not that they don't care, they care desperately for what their children's needs are, but when we're trying to get them to participate in things like you have to reapply for reach up or you have to do these forms, there's just almost like a, not a learned helplessness, but like, a, I don't know which form you're talking about, or I already did that form. Does that make sense? I think there's just so many pieces and so much stress of the end needs. And I guess that's kind of my question is like, how do we continue to support those families and even understanding what all the pieces are that go around to um, getting them a funded spot in a Head Start Center like ours, like all the pieces we need them to do. 
to make that happen. And I think it feels like we're asking too much for too little. Yeah, I think that's I think a, I'll stop. <laughs> an excellent question. And I, you know, that's something that the research, research shows clearly is that when people are stressed, their capacity to, to do the work that's needed to relieve that stress is diminished. And so we put a lot of burdens on our families. And that's the thing that I'm most excited about, about this bill is that the shift in thinking around um, really figuring out what is supportive rather than having requirements for the families who access the services. And oftentimes um, beyond the reapplication process, what we know is that many of our families who are on reach out for longer periods of time have bigger barriers to um, being able to work full time. And many of the families have kids with high medical needs or um, behavioral needs, um, and they actually aren't eligible for some of the childcare programs that are in their area or the after school programs. Um, we know the expulsion rate can be really high in early childcare. And so we're asking them to meet wild schedules um, and then to attend these classes that they may or may not even need. So we talk about the budgeting classes that you know, many people in a very well-meaning way thought if they could help folks budget better, <laughs> then they might not need programs like Reach Up. But from my experience, the families that I've spoken to who are on Reach Up know their budget better than many other folks in the state. They know to the penny how much their utility bills are. They know to the penny how much they have to spend on food because they have such little um, capacity for making errors in their budgets. And so, um, we're really putting a lot of stress and um, expectations on folks when um, oftentimes they're at a time in their life when they really would benefit from support and, um, and really money. I mean, that's, that's the piece that um, they're lacking and the piece that we can help them with as a state. I'm going to move on to um, a short conversation about housing because Right now, the current reach up bill does not have any piece in it, um, does not have a piece in it around guaranteed housing, but there is a lot of other housing work happening within the legislature. And it's hard, I think, for folks to, to figure out exactly where the housing piece belongs because it's in so many different um, programs and there's, it's a pretty complex network. But um, one piece that we wanna make sure that um, everybody is aware of is that families are not able to be stable unless they're in housing that meets their needs long term. And so as much as we support, you know, emergency housing opportunities, there will always be a need for that. We also want to make sure that there's progress towards um, ensuring that families do not have to experience being unhoused. And so we would advocate for more and more shifting language to allow for services to come in sooner and to allow for um, families to access programs when they're on the verge of, of um, being unhoused. And I think that the Families First legislation and other places allow for some possible flexible funding pathways for that. Um, and that's something that we want to continue to explore if it does not end up in this bill um, in, in another place. And so I also want to, I want to leave some time for questions. And I also want to hear a little bit more about your experiences because we do have the opportunity to testify tomorrow. And while I do have some um, stories from folks, it's always helpful to hear more in terms of, you know, if you could change the program, what would you do? Um, but I just kind of want to highlight that one of the pieces of Reach Up is to measure the success of the system by what is best for children. And um, the American Public Human Services Association says that TANF funding rules should be structured in a way that harness the program's flexibility to help states invest in essential programs and services families need to thrive. And I think that's one really important piece of TANF funding that um, is not often known is that the federal government does have requirements around sanctions um, and around work requirements and around other pieces, but they give the state incredible amount of flexibility in terms of how and what they put into the statute for their own practice. And so, for example, with sanctions, we know that punishing folks when they're when they're having a difficult time does not often you know, get the result of motivating them to do things differently. Oftentimes when people are not meeting requirements, it's because there's a barrier to meeting those requirements and taking away funding um, from the kids 
in the household is not um, an effective solution. So in Vermont, you know, we have to have some sort of sanction, but we can choose if it's $1 or maybe $5 is the bottom limit up until the entire budget, um, benefit. And we can choose how it's implemented. And um, so one of our um, pieces of guidance is to be as flexible as possible and to allow um, the reach of case managers to really work with families to figure out what the barriers are to, to meeting their own goals and to help support them in doing that. Um, I wanted to just quickly highlight that um, Dr. Donna Pavetti testified this morning at 8.30. And if you have time, I would recommend that folks listen to it. She did an incredible job of giving the historical context to reach up. Um, she was very impressed with the work that's happening right now and had excellent um, suggestions for what we can do in the future to make sure that our program is um, a model program for the country. After that, um, Commissioner Brown testified, um, and right now I think the department is continuing to testify, and they proposed um, additional language that is e even more progressive, I think, than what was in the draft that came out yesterday. Um, and tomorrow advocates will have a chance to testify and share our thoughts. Um, our, our hope, our guess is that House Human Services would like to move something out of committee by Friday. So there's a short turnaround. The bill will likely progress out of the committee on Friday at the latest. Um, we're getting to that critical crossover deadline. And so um, we'll also have an opportunity to work on the bill more in the Senate. So folks who are connected to reach up and want to advocate um, further um, have an opportunity to do that in the Senate. And so I would I put my contact information um, on the slide and I'm happy to, to talk to anybody who has ideas on the specific language of the bill or even the, the more broad um, policy pieces that we should be considering as we continue to advocate. So I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and I wanna give a chance for um, questions and then also for um, comments and conversation from, from folks in the room. I just, uh, I mostly work, I work at the Addison County Parent Child Center and I mostly work with little kids and their families around parenting, uh, not not so much around reach up, but obviously those stories come in. And that uh, this is just a thought more around delivery. And in Addison County, I know we have a lot of really great people, um, but I wonder about any sort of, I, I find in the times when uh, reach up, case management is not working the best is when um, <clears throat> the delivery model is either rescuing behavior or judging behavior. So just like some sort of um, education and training around remaining curious. I mean, I don't have the right words, but um, Amy, you said people often know what they need if we only stop trying to fix their problems or think we know what they need or only if they did this different or better then wouldn't they reap the benefit. And those, those stories are heartbreaking and also just following people into a building where their dignity is really pushed to the bottom while they tell their trauma stories and have to beg for basic survival is just heartbreaking and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not special that 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 rises up the rescuing behavior in me that I really have to tamp down. Um, so it's just something that has come up in my experience over the last two decades and not a lot so I'm, I'm thankful to be from Vermont and from Madison County. Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. I really appreciate that perspective and I agree. And it actually came up this morning, both from Dr. Pavetti and also um, from the department around sort of just even looking at the way we do applications and our data collection, like why we ask people to tell their trauma over and over again, knowing that that, that has an impact um, and sort of the power dynamic between folks who are in a paid professional role and folks who are coming and asking for services and and that gets to the rescuing piece I believe as well and so um, I do believe that um, the hope is to shift the language within legislation to match sort of the emerging science and emerging practices in parts of the state around um, 
really joining folks and knowing that we're all a big community and we've all struggled and we all need support sometimes and, you know, really coming together to, to create a different model. Um, I think one of the challenges that I see in all programs is that the benefit, the beauty of the programs and the challenge is the humanity, right? And so, it, and that's something that's gonna take time to change. And so even with the best legislation, even with the best implementation plan, you know, we're moving from um, sort of the old welfare reform thinking to a new model. And it's going to take like a collective effort in the state, I think, to, to shift that and to call each other out and call ourselves out when we kind of fall back into that um, place of either rescuing or punishing or, you know, having trauma um, be something that we expect from folks. <laughs> like we, we, we expect that we have the right to, to hear the most intimate um, parts of their lives. And so I really appreciate that. It's really helpful to keep in mind. And I think it's something that will take training. It will take reflection. Um, I would love to see some sort of satisfaction survey kind of tied into anything that we do so that the work is driven by folks who have experienced um, the so-called benefit. Um, so yes, thank you so much for bringing that up. Are there, uh, yeah. Oh, hey, I, I wanted to add that um, I think another helpful frame is just moving away from personal responsibility to a structural, to a structural frame, because I, I mean, the initial welfare program, right, was set up for sort of war widows, and there was just built in acceptance that they were in the situation they were in through no fault of their own, you know, because of the structural consequences of the war, and, uh, and they were white women, <laughs> and um, and it wasn't until um, you know the 70s and 80s when black single moms were were becoming more prevalent on the program that suddenly there was this need to, to demonstrate that you're worthy of the support, and no no structural analysis of what was going on in the broader economy or with racism, white supremacy, whatever. Obviously, we didn't so much have that language maybe at the time, but actually that's not true. We definitely did. <laughs> um, to, but there was just a, a complete shift, right? In like, you have to prove you're worthy, you have to jump through hoops. Um, and we need to get back to a recognition that people who find themselves in these circumstances are, um, it, it's as a result of policy choices, as a result of, you know, our econo economic system. Um, and yeah, within that, there may be personal choices that can be made, but we have to deal with the system-wide, um, drivers of of like generational poverty before we can start you know asking people to anyway I could go on and on about this but I want to open it up for other thoughts and comments and then I can share a little bit about some of the pieces that aren't in this bill that have been kind of my own personal <laughs> um hopes for the program that um I would like to find a way to advocate for in the upcoming year Um, so quickly, I put in the chat the, the list of documents, which has the current draft of the bill today posted, because I think there will be a new draft posted again today based on the testimony this morning. And so it's changing pretty rapidly. Um, and my hope is that by Friday, we'll have something that we can share with folks who are interested that um, is likely going to be close to what comes out of the House and will be the starting point for the work in the Senate. Um, so at Voices, um, for, for those of you who don't know so, um, some of my history, <laughs> I've been working in numerous roles. And one of the bills that I've been most connected to is the Office of Child, Youth, and Family Advocate. And in that, in that work, I've done a lot of work listening to families and youth and foster families and others who have experienced multiple systems of care. And one thing that continues to come up is a federal law that um, makes it so that reach up it's so that families who enter the child protection system and stay in the system for more than 180 days are no longer eligible for the reach up benefits. And what we see from that is that oftentimes uh, many of the goals within their, their family support plan include economic stability, whether it be um, housing or 
transportation to medical appointments or other pieces. And so oftentimes, once that reach up benefit ends, the family has a even bigger uphill battle to, to get to reunification. They often lose their housing and then housing is a um, requirement for unification. And we just see this spiraling happening that, um, that ends up costing the state a lot of money because we know that kids who are adopted, you know, have a, have a child benefit of over $500 a month until they're 18. So we're really like, it's not, we're kind of moving them deeper and deeper into the system of support. Um, and so, while we can work as a state to try to shift that federal practice, we also have the opportunity as a state, I think, to, to use our own state dollars to kind of help fund these families. And it's not a large number of families, but to help fund these families until they can either get to a place of stabilization or there's a um, more permanent shift in their family structure. And so what we hear often from advocates, both in the court system and family advocates and foster family advocates is that that cutoff of reach up after that 180 days is really a difficult barrier to overcome. So that's another piece that um, wouldn't be possible to shift in this legislation in the, in, in the sense that it's a federal, um, it's a federal piece, but we could be creative as a state to figure out how to how to support those families differently, um, possibly through Families First or through other pieces, but kind of weaving and braiding the systems together in order to, to meet their needs during that really difficult time. I know we're getting close to the end and I, I wanna make sure once again that we have a chance for comments and questions. Then I just have a curious curiosity question. Um, how it looks as though if I'm looking through the list um, of participants, it looks like we have a pretty broad um, group of participants. And I'm wondering um, how familiar you are with the current bill and also um, I guess I'm curious about how how accessible and transparent this, the legislative process is for you. Um, are there things that we can send to you or updates or ways to get the information to you in a different way so that we can continue to, to engage folks who work directly with children and families and have um, valuable information on, on what is needed? I feel pretty lucky at my center. We have a weekly staff meeting and Donna Bailey is my co-director. She's been a sole co-director for many years now, but She's still co-director. Anyway, she gives us <clears throat> legislative updates regularly, and I don't hear that happening in a lot of other places. Um, and so just here today, we have probably, she supported four of our staff people in an understaffed building to be here. And I just think that kind of leadership in direct service is really important. Also to like empower people who are working with little kids, like you actually do know and your voice does matter. Thank you. And absolutely, the, the information coming, I think, to the legislature is often what makes um, the biggest difference. Um, we have the research, um, legislators have the research, we have the data, but really understanding sort of what's behind that data is what um, creates the desire for change. So I really appreciate that. Um, there was a little bit, so one of the other things that's that we've been working on with Reach Up um, this session is the budget advocacy. And so um, in the governor's proposed 23 budget, um, there was a there was basically what they call a sweep. So they determined a caseload savings based on projected declining participation rates. Um, and so that money would be taken out of the reach up program and used for other things. Um, and House Human Services has created a letter and used new budget, um, new caseload predictions to, to show that with all of the federal relief ending, <laughs> that there's likely not going to be a decrease in the need for reach up in the, in the upcoming year. And so they've rejected that sweep. Um, 
I think it's the right choice. And I'm curious from folks in the room, have you seen sort of a decrease in need for financial support in the last year or so, or have you seen, seen something different? I see heads shaking. <laughs> Um, I've, this is Lindsay um, from Oak Hill Children's Center. Um, I've definitely seen an increase in, in need for funding. Like, I, I don't think we're going to see a decrease if federal aid is ending and there's just not enough resources for everybody. Um, and there's even people out there who try to get help, but they still don't qualify for help under um, the income basis that they have. <laughs> I think that's going to be another critical advocacy point is that um, as a state, we've received, you know, an unprecedented influx in federal funding for a short period of time. And while that's been really helpful, I think many folks who um, are economically stable have come to assume that that means that all of the needs of Vermonters are being met. And so there's been an interesting conversation around, you know, food security, around housing needs and around, you know, even meeting basic needs where um, I think people see all the programs being offered and um, think that we've gotten to a place of, um, abundance, honestly, <laughs> in some ways. And, and that's not what um, I'm seeing in my community. And so anytime that folks have an opportunity to talk with their representatives and share the real lifetime struggles that that folks are, are experiencing or bring people to talk about, you know, the barriers to accessing the programs that are out there, you know, lack of housing stock, lack of um, ability to, to get needs met, it's really helpful. And even around the work piece, I think, you know, th this, the story that I have with me right now is, you know, somebody who has taken advantage of every opportunity that's been given. And during the time of COVID with limited school hours and folks being out, it's, it's almost impossible <laughs> to meet the work requirements of a, of a job that does not have flexibility around working from home. And so um, we have to be aware of that burden as, as well. And the fact that, you know, people who, are working both in their homes with their families and also in a, in a paid capacity um, are, are really struggling right now. Seeing a lot in the chat. I'm just gonna pause and see if anyone who's typing um, wants, to, wants to speak. Mm. Um, I just want to add that like the, the, the one of the consequences of not um, tying the grant amounts to the cost of living, having it, having it indexed, which, um, you know, not a lot of programs have, um, but it obviously reduces their buying power every year. And, and therefore, like as the rest of the world um, or the rest of the economy kind of moves on it, it, it almost effectively pushes people out of the program, right? So it's, it's, there's less people that are eligible for it because, um, because it's not keeping up with inflation. And so it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy if the numbers on reach up are going down, um, that one of the main causes is because the program's no longer meeting its statutory purpose. That seems really problematic. Um, Amy, I wonder if I could just take like a minute to mention the child tax credit conversation too. Is that, is this an okay time to do that? That sounds great. Yeah, just kind of in alignment with what we're talking about of like what really until we got people's basic needs met like economically that asking them to do the programmatic, programmatic work for those who, you know, need that or, or desire it um, is kind of putting the cart before the horse. And so kind of out of left field, you know, this child tax credit proposal came from the legislature and passed the House, and I, we have yet to see how the Senate will respond to it, but creating a Vermont child tax credit, which would be $1,200 a year, would be $100 per child per, wait, is that right, per month? Yes, <laughs> math. <laughs> um, 
and uh, but half of it would be, you could get half of it in advance, um, basically at back to school time, and then the rest you would be able to claim um, at, during your tax filing time. And the cap, I th think the cap in the bill that passed the house is um, a $200,000 uh, uh, AGI or whatever, and whether it's a single or a, a joint filing. So that's, it captures really most, it captures a lot of the kids and it's for kids six and under. Um, there's some pieces of that bill that we're really curious whether it's, it's set up to really direct the resources to the people who need them most. We might want to look at lowering that um, filing amount down a little lower and see if we can extend the ages that are included a little higher, you know, um, so as to not create benefits cliffs for, um, for low-income families when their kids turn seven. But um, the idea of uh, refundable credits that have no requirements, you know, you, you basically just have to file your taxes, whether or not you owe any taxes, um, is certainly the direction that we would like to see supports for families with children go. Um, and then obviously maintain program um, assistance and, you know, whatever else for the families who, who would like that in order to overcome other barriers. But like cash in hand is sort of the first and <laughs> best intervention. So stay tuned on that. It's not on the, it's not on the Alliance's agenda because it just came out of, it, we, we were surprised by it. Um, so we're trying to do some analysis about how the various tax credit proposals, some that the governor put out and then this, the legislature's proposal, how they, how they, like what's the best model to benefit, um, to target those resources that the families that need it most. Okay, well, we're running right up to the 1140 cutoff time and um, give folks a few extra minutes to transition into lunch. I'm going to stay on if folks, if anyone has questions about what Michelle just shared or about reach up. And I'm also going to put my name, my email address in the chat in case people want to connect more directly with this bill or be a part of a distribution list that we have around reach up updates. We're also hosting a more broad economic justice um, conversation, which includes things that Michelle mentioned, but also sort of other ways to lessen the need for our safety net programs. And I'm happy to share more with that about that with anybody who's interested as well. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just want to remind people to um, make sure you close your Zoom link and go right to the um, agenda, sign into the um, lunch, and um, and then you can put yourself on um, mute and, and um, pause your camera, go get some lunch, but that will help to get you assigned to your correct room for um, your meeting with the legislators. So thank you again um, for attending this session and have a nice lunch with your legislators.